uh, wherever books are sold, or you can mm-hmm. if uh, go to her Twitter page at uh, dagger underscore actual and download a PDF of it if you want. Although I, I think it's a really good book and it's definitely worth getting a physical copy of. And she runs uh, surfaces.cx. Uh, so check that out. Anything else you want to plug before you go, Mika? Uh, I don't think so. That's about it. Like I am writing a book named Dog Food Summer, so I guess hope like look out for that when I post about it. I can't um, wait. That really does sound. Yeah, like I've seen the uh, the uh, excerpts you posted on Twitter, and it definitely looks really intense, and I definitely can't wait to read it. All right. Um, well, thank you very much for coming on, Mika. It's been a yeah, pleasure. Thank you, Mika. Thank you. All right, talk to you later. Mm-hmm. Eric Sprague, the yep. self uh, lizard man. Thank you so much Sprague. for joining us, man. Uh, I, I just I heard you for the first time on an old Opie and Anthony bit. Uh, a few weeks yeah, you, ago. you went back for that one because I was like, who, who's watching old O and A stuff now? Like, <laughs> that's ju- that's just on the edge of when there's right. things that were that when that stuff was recorded, right? Because that's a, right, that, that's the beginning of having a webcam in the studio and having any video for any of that stuff at all. Like, you know, yeah. It's, yeah, anything I think about like my own history, like touring and doing morning radio shows, like yeah, the like even the big ones having the camera in studio wasn't a regular thing and they weren't archiving it yeah, yeah speaking of archiving things like mika was talking about right if, if if people don't preserve this stuff man you know it's it's gone forever and uh you know uh what was it uh, was it k-rock or, or uh whoever it was that was that 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 hosted o and a and howard stern for all those years Seriously. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah well uh, yeah, they, yeah when they went from terrestrial on yeah because yeah, i remember yeah. when there was the point where uh they were doing the walk between because i did that a couple of times with them promoting wow. the old jägermeister music tour you know we'd have our new york dates and go down and do the show and it was the time where they do the, the first half of the show i think was uh all terrestrial or just like Susan, and then they'd walk over to the satellite studio yeah you still you still oh. there and they can't what, yeah, you're. Uh, you're. Um, I don't know if you froze. Yeah, yeah it looks like you. I don't know if you can hear us, there, but you're frozen. I okay. yeah, I can okay. hear you now. Yeah. So yeah, so um, I don't know where that got cut out, but yeah, just it, the historical stuff. Yeah, um, you had these weird concoctions that you would like eat and drink too. <laughs> that were all part of the the big performance. How how was uh how was uh this shit going on? impacted your ability to perform in front of people and i mean do you have to use your webcam a lot to to get out there now or what i mean that's basically all i've done since uh well march 17th of 2020 i flew back from australia i wrapped up a festival down there uh which was it was actually we were really lucky that we started like basically the quarantines and like there's remember the toilet paper shortages and all that they were just starting to hit really hard as we wrapped up the So I at least got, you know, that money in the bank, you know, for, you know, part of that year for 2020 and then came back and then it was just stressed. Like everything got pushed back and pushed back, but all I've done are, you know, podcasts via zoom, things like that. There's a brief period for about two months here in the summer though, where between I got fully vaccinated in uh, mid April. And so there was a time when the things started to reopen, like uh, open mics were going on again. So I was going out to comedy clubs and, you know, just kind of, you know, after a forced year off, getting a little bit of a feel back to it. But then we had the variant surge and, you know, the situation we're in now, which is, you know, the numbers right now where I am in Austin are some of the worst that have been for the entire pandemic. We are in far worse shape, you know, especially hospital staff and bed wise than we ever were back during the lockdowns. Hmm. Man, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, are you still sponsored by Jägermeister or do you still tour? Do you still do anything with the Jim Rose circus when permitted? <laughs> I haven't worked with Jim since, uh, 2001. That's, uh, we just, yeah, I mean, like it, it was great to be part of the circus and it was a really good experience in a lot of ways, but we just don't work the same way. We're very, very different people. And that was, you know, uh, a marriage of, financial convenience and opportunity, right? So I was, uh, 
up up and coming. You know, I have my Ripley's episode coming out like that. So it's good to for me to get out there and get on a big tour. He had that to offer. He was also at the time in need of people to perform. Lifto, Enigma, and it all just left. Came in to replace three people. <laughs> yeah, wow. I took on all the acts plus the ones that I brought. But yeah, by after about two years of doing tours now, we sort of just kind of recognized and amicably said, yeah, you know, we work better apart. Like I'm happier doing my own thing or I was happier, you know, doing my thing for companies like Jaeger and for Ripley's and things like that. And, you know, he's just, you know, it's, it's just better when you get along with the people that you have to work with. Right. That's the situation in an office. It's even more so the situation on a tour bus. You know, a lot of great bands have suffered not for lack of talent or creativity but for a lack of an ability to get along together and yeah we weren't going to get along together <laughs> um wow one of my friends uh says she met the lizard man at the airport once he was awesome and beautiful <laughs> New, she's a she's a jersey girl uh but anyway um so did you ever did you ever uh, uh, like do any opening act for like somebody like Slipknot or, you know, metal bands? Well, that's what I did with hosting for the Jägermeister music tour. And that's, uh, you know, our headliners. You just named a couple of them right there. But I just go through them. Like we had uh, Head P and Saliva the first year that I did it. Uh, then we had Slipknot, the second one, then Slayer, um, Alter Bridge, yeah, Slayer. Uh, Disturb. Yeah. The story that the Alter Bridge one was a weird one out of there. If you look at the whole list of Jaeger tours, there's it's like a dozen of them, and we're like, yeah, and then Alter Bridge in the middle there. But yeah, it, oh, yeah so there's it. That's it, like a Crazy Town in the middle of the day at Ozfest. It just doesn't quite work. Right. So there are all this weird side. What's well, the worst case I've ever seen of that was on the Slayer tour in 2004, where we had a band and I knew them. They were a Jaeger sponsored band. They played on a lot of other shows that I had been the tour host with. And you're getting back to what we were talking about before. It's like, that's what I would do is I would do sideshow acts. And then Did you fade out? Their kangaroo album from my earlobes. But um, yeah, we had on that Slayer tour, we were in New Orleans. And it was wild because they wanted to reward this band. It had done really good uh, promoting for Jaeger and everything. And their, their numbers were going up. They were doing pretty well on like a regional level. And I think they had just done a tour with like Better Than Ezra. So that's the style of band they were. But based on the stuff that they had done touring wise like that, this rep, somebody just looking at numbers, not looking at musical styles, looked at the numbers and said, oh, yeah, put them on the next show. They've got really good numbers for us. Like, yeah, but it's the Slayer show. And this is a band that tours with better than Ezra. And that's the first time I ever saw two guys lift up another guy so that he could moon the band from the pit. <laughs> he stood on two dudes' shoulders, dropped his pants, full on fucking moon the band. <laughs> People were flicking lit cigarettes at them. The rug is at the House of Blues, New Orleans. The fucking rug is smoking with lit cigarettes. People are causing these things. And to their credit, they just fucking manned up and played their set like the fucking Blues Brothers with the fucking bottles coming through the chicken wire shit. That's it. They're like, just just play the set, play the set. They played it. They got screamed at, shouted down, you know, and. Um, yeah, yeah, not the right band to, to put on as the local opener for a Slayer show, but you know, not half bad dudes, and they did what they could. <laughs> did you did you ever? I imagine that most people uh, would rather ingratiate themselves, you know, because you, what you know what you do is distinctly, you know, it has a metallic, a heavy metal, you know, uh, tinge to it, you know. But have you ever had anyone? openly hostile toward you uh i imagine not very often but i don't know yeah i mean not openly hostile i mean it's the thing is like even people who don't like what i do or wouldn't approve of what i've done to myself my body well there's plenty of people that have those issues but i'm not usually going where they are right i'm not showing up at evangelical mega churches and hanging out in the parking lots on sunday afternoons trying to meet these motherfuckers <laughs> right i don't need them in my life so, but you know, every now and then, yeah, we cross by in an airport or something. They're not going to yell and scream at me, especially these sorts of people. Bigots in general don't have a lot of balls, right? Unless there's like a hundred of them and they know they've got the power, right? They're basically cowards. So in a public setting, they're not just going to yell and scream at me for the same reason, you know, that, you know, there's plenty of racists who walk around, but they don't scream the N word all the time because they know they're going to get their ass beat, right? <laughs> and they're like, 
So, you know, somebody who thinks like, oh, fucking tattoos are horrible. And, you know, heavy metal music is a tag or that. They're not going to jump in my face because they don't know if they've got any backup. But they know I'm probably going to be. Don't have any backup and they're going to be. Pass. Yeah. Sorry, you keep uh, freezing occasionally. Yeah. It, it's yeah. not. It's not too bad. Um, but uh, what? What is? What? It, first off, what is this? You you've done where mm. where our eyebrows are 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 those? What are those sewn in or? Yeah, is that like silicone or is that are those like the, implants? The, the, yeah, it, it, they're actually Teflon implants. They're uh, a little bit older. Teflon. Mine were done in 1998. And silicon at that time was it was something that they were just trying out for certain types of implants and everything. And it's it's become a big boom because uh, the difference being that silicon can be compressed. So you can do a very small incision and compress the implant and place it inside. Whereas for mine, you had to make an incision that was a little bit wider than the widest base because there's five pieces in there. They kind of look like uh, like the tips of a bullet. It would look like um, just kind of a rounded cone. And yeah, that's a... It's the most painful thing I've ever done in my life, whether on accident or on purpose. It's the most pain I've ever felt. I actually hallucinated and vomited from the pain. Wow, oh, wow. And uh, how how long did it take for, for these patches on your cheeks? Oh, well, I you know that's just the tattooing there. Uh, I don't for individual sections. I don't really have a good uh, piece of time for for most of it. For overall, I can say it's been roughly around 700 hours, and it was done over the course of 25 years. So I got my first tattoo in January of 1994, and then I finished it in January of uh, 19, or 2019. Now the tongue. No. Did that right? I, I got it. I'm sorry. I'm thinking about that. I'm like, did I have my, my years right? Yeah, 94. But uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so the tongue, I'm, I would mm -hmm. imagine that would have been painful. Well, I mean, it wasn't, it doesn't, just because it's not the most painful thing doesn't mean it wasn't uncomfortable, right? Uh, the big thing with tongue splitting. How long did it the, take to the, the tongue splitting was actually done. Mine was the, the first surgical tongue splitting. It's done by an oral surgeon with a biopsy laser. So my tongue was burned in half, which gives you the interesting sensation of tasting and smelling your own burning tongue as it's happening which is probably grosser, that, that, that sort of nausea, stomach churning, sort of burning flesh in your mouth thing for me was more overwhelming than the actual pain. Now I had been given a little bit of a lidocaine because they wanted me to hold, be able to hold still and uh, my tongue was being held in forceps uh, so you could get a nice clean burn and keep the separation going. Uh, but there was still, I mean, again, not the worst pain that I felt, that being the implants, but still pretty bad. The next 48 hours, the swelling was so intense. It literally felt like my tongue was bursting in my mouth, just a constant throbbing ache. Pretty much spent two days sucking on ice chips and trying to stay unconscious, taking pain meds. Well, that's always fun. <laughs> but um, so, uh, I mean, have you, have you been able to, you know, set up uh, – uh, a system where you can kind of take younger uh, body. What, what what would you call it? Body modificationists, body, body, modification body modifiers, body. body modification enthusiasts. You know, it's, I don't think there's a a formal label or anything. I don't think there's anything anybody's going to get bent out of shape out of, about either. As long as you know, if you're talking about like people who want to do something similar or want to undertake heavy or extreme you, modification of their body, I get. I get emails all the time from people asking for advice and, and sort of things like that. Now I'm not looking to put myself out there as an authority by any means. I have a certain amount of experience, obviously. And I have, you know, just because it's of interest to me, I do spend a good deal of time trying to keep abreast of what's going on, you know, industry wise, at least general strokes with, you know, things like the larger organizations like the APP, the Association of Professional Piercers. Uh, things like that. Yeah, I take, try and tell them, I'm like, look, I'll give you my opinion. Your opinion, I'll give them your opinion. I heard that much. He'll come back. 
Yeah, I, I can see and hear you guys, but I don't know yeah. what I'm from you. <laughs> you, 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 you. You can give them your opinion. Right. And that's what we heard. Well, oh, and I say, and I said, but I always tell people, like, remember, it's just my opinion. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, so as I say, like, I don't, I, you shouldn't necessarily, you shouldn't listen to me because I'm the lizard man and I know what I'm talking about. So they're not going to make an appeal to throw like that, but I can say, Hey, I'm the lizard man. And that means I've had certain experiences and I would, I will gladly share when I think there's something that I've learned from my experience that might help someone else. Yeah. That's, but yeah, you, you take it with a great thought. You know, if anybody's looking for, you know, when people go looking for answers and like, oh, just tell me that, like, that's to be as dangerous. Like, hey, just don't do that. Don't let somebody else make your decisions for you. <laughs> yeah, they'll be like, oh, well, you, you, you know, you know about this. Tell me what to do. No, 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 no. It's you know about this. Tell me so I. Yeah, with uh. So with with what uh, with with the amount of dedication that you have had to to modifying your body, um, I, I, I kind of feel like a lot of people who come to you looking for advice probably don't have the follow through the you know the dedication to it that maybe they want to take it to a certain point, but ultimately they don't they're not as committed to it as 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 you probably were, which is why they're coming to you for advice in the first place because. They, they may want to in uh, what's the word um, imitate, you know, right. or, but, well, but it's actually pretty rare. Like I've only had in, in over you know 25 years now of being a professional fake touring and being a public figure, or whatever that's worth. I've only had a couple of people approach me saying that they were interested in doing something similar on a career level, you know, wanting to become a, a performer and wanting to become heavily modified like that. The thing I get most often actually are younger people who are, want something like a split tongue or implants or you know, are very gung ho to get their face tattooed and are having issues with their family or just, you know, having issues trying to find someone to do it because they're so young. And it's a really, you know, it's a difficult situation because I try to think back to when I was younger and, and what that's like, like, you know, because they, they want it now. They're like, Oh, you know, somebody will say like, I want to get a split tongue and I want to get implants. And I'd love to tattoo my face. And it's like, Oh, and you're what you're 17 years old. No. Whoa. Yeah. 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 Right? But, it, but it's, but I mean, I still, even though I'm almost 50, I remember what it's like to be 17. And I'm like, you couldn't have told me anything that would have changed my mind. I was too damn dumb. So I'm sitting here <laughs> as an old person going, I don't know. I, I couldn't even talk myself out of shit. How am I supposed to talk somebody else out of it? Yeah. And not talk them out of it, but tell them to do it the smart way, right? There's Look, there you can do dumb things in smart ways. In fact, I like to sort of, sometimes that's why I brag. I go, look, I've been successful because I've done every dumb thing that I've done, I've done in the smartest way possible. I had a plan. You know, I had a reason. I, I had... You know, uh, even if it was a very unlikely goal that I was shooting for, I still had one that was in sight and a way to get to it rather than just, you know, blindly going, hey, tattoo my face. Maybe something will work out. I'm like, no, I had a, <laughs> there's a thought process that went into it. I there were stages I put myself through, you know, and things that I did beforehand to, that I thought would give me the best possible odds. And, it, you know, thus far, yes, it's, it's worked out. But it's, you know, it's like trying to get into the NBA or the NFL, you know, for every person that tries, only a very few would get through. Right. So that's always that risk that's there. And, you know, I think, you know, sometimes people have looked at me and been like, yeah, that's you. I could do that, too. I could tattoo my face. I could learn to swallow swords. I could I could do that. So I'm like, no, you think you can. But you only know if you can if you do it. And the problem is, once you do it, you can't undo it. Mm -hmm. Um, right. You, you can't seem... undo tattooing your face. You, you, in fact, I've known people that have been that way. They've been like, oh, shit. Like they get them removed or they cover them up because all of a sudden they realize they don't want to be the guy with the tattooed face all the time. And if you've got a tattoo on your face, too bad. You're the guy with the tattoo on your face all the time. That's it. That's yeah, the, there's right. one. Uh, there's one rapper. I can't remember which one, but apparently like they did that on purpose. They got tattoos on their face because they thought it would force them to uh, uh, 
pursue their rap career because since they've got the tattooed face, you know, they can't really do right, a, no a whole lot else. <laughs> yeah, um, it did work out for them, but you know, in, in retrospect, that probably wasn't the smartest way to go about it. Yeah, that's not a good bet, right? There's, yeah. there's no, that's the sort of bet when the bookie is like, oh, fuck yeah, I'll take that bet. You, you should be like, oh, maybe I don't want to do this then, you know? And any bookie would have been like, fucking give me your money. <laughs> It's, it's like someone trying to tattoo Budweiser on their neck or something to get Budweiser's attention, as opposed right. to the guy who gets endorsements, corp, you know, deals, yeah. sponsors, endorsement deals tattooed on his body. I'll, I'll let you tattoo this on on me for this amount for this. You know, yeah, that yeah. that is. Or smart. like I, you know, I, I know people that I work with at Jägermeister who are, or others like, and it's like if I decided to, if I got like a Jägermeister like a deer head or something. Mm -hmm. I knew people that were like me, they were independent contractors, hired, but we, I, I, more than five years of my life hosting tours with them. A lot of the people at that company are family, you know, to me. So that, that would be reflected. It would, oh, I got this Jägermeister tattoo so I could get money from Jägermeister. It'd be like, no, I've actually have a real bond with the people that make up that company. And it represents a significant portion of my life and career. You know, I, I, I could very easily see doing that, you know, in that way. Um. I think it's great that you you are so comfortable with your choices, you know. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, there are some days where I'm not comfortable just looking the way I do without any, you know, help. But right. uh, <laughs> but it seems like there there have been some who have and gone down this road. Huh? When when, th when things are going your, when things are going your way, it's it's fairly. Uh, and I've got to say that you know for. I didn't, uh, it wasn't overnight by any means. Like I had to get tattooed. Obviously I, you know, I, I did my struggling artist phase, whatever, but from the time things took off, they, they went very well and went steady, you know? So, uh, going out with Jim Rose on tour in 1999, uh, doing the Ripley's TV show in 2000, 2001, going to Universal Studios and performing for Halloween Horror Nights till 2003, when I start doing the Jaeger tour, then I'm with them until 2008. Then I'm going international. I'm doing uh, tattoo tours across Europe. 2012, I'm in Australia doing Fringe Fest and in the, the UK for the Olympics doing a pop-up sideshow. I mean, the, the only thing that's ever slowed me down in over 20 years now is a worldwide play. <laughs> so it's hard to complain. There have been others who have gone down this path who seem like they may not have been as comfortable with their choices later and um, I hope this isn't a sore spot to bring this up, but, uh, uh, I, he was a friend of yours, Dennis. The oh yeah. Cat. Talking cat. Yeah. Well, and the thing with him was, I don't think he ever regretted it because we, we were actually close. We knew. I'm sorry. You cut out there. Hang on. Each other behind. Okay. Okay. I'll start again. So that, uh, A stalking cat was a friend that I knew through a mutual acquaintances of body. Model. And one of the things that for him, he, I never got the sense that he regretted his choices because he, what he did was very important to him. However, being a public persona was not something he ever intended or asked for. It was a means to an end doing things like that. Like for Ripley, that was a check money that he could get for it was there, but you know, he didn't embrace the sort of, but for me as a performer, I, it's, that, and the type of performer I am doing sideshow and live, uh, you know, street theater and street performance, stuff like that means that, yeah, I'm, I do want to say, what is the skill that I bring to any situation? It, it's an ability to deal with the public. Mm. He didn't embrace it in that way. I don't know how much of that cut out or not, but I mean, I, the, the gist of it being that for him, he, he loved his choices, but he didn't love being in the spotlight. Right. Um, I understand there's another lizard man. The, are you? <laughs> I, have not, I have no, like, do you mean by name? There's a, uh, there's a DJ who's nicknamed the lizard man and there's a biologist at uh, university, the university of Texas who uh, Steven Pinkerton or something like that, 
but he's a uh, he actually works with reptiles, the herpetologist, <laughs> who's uh, I think he's known as the lizard man in some circles. But uh, other than that, no. <laughs> That's what are, what are some other, uh, okay, so we've got the cat man and the lizard man. What are some other, ha, how many, uh, is there a convention where you guys get together, you know, in one place or are there, wh are there more examples out there? You know, there, there are a few, you've got the, um, other than, uh, I mean, obviously stalking cat is now deceased. Uh, Larry, the leopard exit, but also now no longer with us. Um, so, there, yeah, a, a couple of years ago, there were more. Now it's basically, there's myself, uh, for completely tattooed performers, myself and the Enigma, who are out and actively working. Lucky Diamond Rich, the most tattooed man in the world, has uh, retired from performing and taken a regular job. He's gone nine to five, living in the suburbs uh, down in Sydney. So yeah, basically for, uh, for completely tattooed, heavily modified performers, these days you're looking at myself and the enigma enigma is the guy with the the jigsaw pieces tattooed right, right? blue blue, oh, man, blue puzzle pieces wicked. yeah it looks wicked. well it's, it's 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 lighting in color like if you actually see him in person it's like sometimes people look at my green and say like oh it looks bluish mm. if you see us in person he's more blue than you would expect and i'm usually more greener than people expect you because it just doesn't come through like right now i can see you know my camera here the, the green on my throat is actually a very bright green. And it just, it never really comes through it, even if you get it lit well. Yeah. Yeah. I could, yeah. I so he's, he's blue, I'm green. <laughs> but. What are these uh, dolls uh, over your right, sh your right shoulder there? Are they, uh, are they just so, visual aids or? <laughs> the, uh, this is a statue. This is a, a bust of me that was made by a sculptor in Australia. Uh, a friend of mine, the Space Cowboy, he's a sword swallower and who puts on a freak show in Australia for the Adelaide Fringe that I participate in, or did participate in until uh, the pandemic kicked in. Uh, he had one made for his personal museum of himself. He wanted one of me and a couple of other people. So he had one made, and when he had it made, he had the artist make an extra one so that I could have one as well. I've obviously, you know, I've thrown a clown nose and some googly eyes, a pair of my old sunglasses, one of my and it wears a lot of my old laminates and uh, tour credentials. My cool. Guinness medal is on there. <clears throat> the uh, the other guy in the back is just a trash sculpture of mine. Mm. That's uh, trash totem number one. Now, what's what's the Guinness medal? What did you win a drinking contest or something? <laughs> I assume you mean uh, Guinness oh, Book of World Records. Oh, oh, uh, duh. <laughs> okay. The medal. Yeah. So I got I got my medal. Jesus, uh, and I was slow on the uptake on that one. <laughs> yeah, that's a, well, that's it what? is the same. It, well, I mean, it, it is originally the same company. It, oh, okay. Yeah, you know, corporate entities. Split. Which is weird. I've actually oh, never made that connection. <laughs> well, the the story about it is is that they started keeping a record to to settle bar bet dispute and bar dispute. So maybe like Jack Johnson's <laughs> the fastest man in the world. He ran the ten and they look, and they get the book out. He's right. I am. Yeah. <laughs> So you you've you've had a, a, a good uh, audience uh, with the heavy metal crowd, and um, do you, do you see yourself? Well, I think and metal go together pretty easily, right? It's they not really do. Like, you can I mean, you can do you can do sideshow to to any music, right? And you can put any act to metal, but some fit better than others. <laughs> I mean, uh, I I could see crossover potential with. Guar, you know, mm -hmm. Slipknot, which I've, I've worked that. with. Uh, I've worked with Slimenstra, Guar woman. Oh Slimenstra. yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Daniel uh, Daniel Stamp was part of the original Brothers Grimm sideshow that I worked with. Uh, also part of House of Poppin for a while. We worked together there. Uh, we've done a couple of just random projects where we both got booked. So yeah, she's been a friend uh, for a long time. She's great, and yeah, I've been a long time fan of Guar's. Uh, been on a few different festivals where we kind of crossed over and I hang out. Uh, first year I did Riot Fest with Hell's a Poppin. They had me and the me and Guar in the press tent at the same time, which was a pretty decent little spectacle. <laughs> right. Um, ha, ha, has anyone attempted a long form documentary about you and your life and career? Um, I, I, I wouldn't I'm say a, long 
form, but there have been, you know, a number of it's, – it's been a little while. Like, so you could do – if you go looking for them, you know, you can find, like, the stuff that I did with uh, Discovery, National Geographic, Learning Channel. You know, decent pieces ranging from, you know, 20 minutes to 45, depending on the, on the program. But a lot of those were done, you know, at least 15 years or, or more ago. So that, back then it was more focused on like, hey, have you heard about the lizard man type of thing? So a lot of them kind of like, it was very much those first few years where I got a lot of coverage because it's like, oh boy, a new thing, right? I'm the, the new kid on the scene, get a little bit of extra attention. And then everybody, you know, gets used to you having you around. And they start taking you for granted. And <laughs> then it becomes a little while, but there have been a few, but nothing really long, long form and uh, mostly focused on performing and touring. So, I mean, the, the, the networks you mentioned, though, aren't they kind of PG? And so don't they only get like a peek behind the veil, you know, of, of, of your whole world? Wait, we were filmed as part of a real sex episode because that was the only I think that was the only uh, show that, yeah, you know, would get by back. And this is back in the 90s. Um, standards and practices would go for it. Um, you know. Now it's the, you usually got the whatever makes the cut for TV, and then there's an on an uncensored online version, yeah, you know, depending on who's doing it or the footage gets out either way. Yeah, yeah, I would have assumed like Vice or something would have tried to do a, at least a mini documentary about you or people with similar body modifications. Oh, it's the the thing is that there's there's a number of like weird things we had to do. Like there's a lot of stuff that's always like, oh, it's so it's like why hasn't this happened? It's like, well, because it doesn't just have, right. It's like, well, they don't want to pay for it. Right. Or there's, yeah. it, it, or there's a time or a schedule mismatch. It, there's just all sorts of different things. Like, or they want to do it a certain way. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm in this weird sort of time period, like in a middle part of it because I'm you know older and like, so early, early on online, I was everywhere because I was, you know, before Google, I was one of the number one results for Sideshow just because there wasn't that much online. Right? It was me and Coney Island, you know, because uh, Fredini is all, was also a nerd, and the, we were the two uh, Sideshow nerds that actually made web pages back then before everybody had to have a web page. So I got a lot of early online stuff. So it was big, but I wasn't. I never got that. It was before things went viral, before there were enough people online for anything to go viral. The internet was still small. You know, mid early mid nineties. That's what I'm starting to you know do a lot of this stuff. And then when I do TV, I, uh, my TV stuff all sort of hits in the early 2000s when streaming starts to take over. So I was in that period of time where all the internet people that would approach you never had any money and were never going to give you any money. <laughs> right. And not that that's changed that much, but yeah, it's just, I just it's remember the matter of had, timing. I just remember the, the feature, uh, the first time I heard about you and Dennis, uh, was this very brief segment for each of you on Beyond Bazaar, I believe it was called. Right. <laughs> and uh, I was like, wait a minute. No, that can't be the end of it. I've got to know more, you know? <laughs> right. Well, that is the thing, too, like we were talking about, too, about the O&A stuff and you're finding out, like, those old things. Is that, again, like, because I was early enough in sort of Internet history, like, you know, we always say the Internet doesn't forget. Well, it, it actually it has. It's forgotten a lot because a lot of shit just never got saved never got backed up, you know, was, yeah. was never there or has been purged at one time or another. So, you know, it's like if I had done, you know, if, if I had done you know, National Geographic Taboo in 2012, the clip would be on YouTube and be easily findable, right? But no, I did it in 2004. So you usually got to find some copy that somebody, some fan uploaded somewhere that will get taken down if it ever gets found, right? Because there isn't an official one online. Yeah. So if this channel ever gets zapped, make sure the, the, the few fans we actually have actually save these in case my, uh, th you know, flash drive gets zapped or something. But uh, keep circulating the tapes. <laughs> um, you mentioned sword swallowing earlier. Um, yep. I imagine that that there are always going to be people that are, you know, Taking you by taking people behind the curtain, the uninitiated, saying, "Here's how we do this." But uh, I mean, do you? Do well, it's you pretty find, easy with uh, sword swallowing. The way the way that we swallow swords is exactly the way we do it on stage. Like taking you behind the curtain and doing it for you back there is not going to be any different. <laughs> There's literally nothing mm -hmm. hidden. It's uh, you know, it's, 
controlling the diaphragm or what? I mean, it, it's it's yeah, it's basically conditioning your body and learning to control your reflexes. And it's you know it it varies from individual to individual, but it will generally take at least weeks, if not months, and be very uncomfortable and unpleasant. And yeah, you know, that's why a lot of people will start trying to do it and then just eventually give up because they're like, no, this sucks too much. It's worth it. <laughs> um, because it's just, yeah, it's, it's literally just shoving a sword down your throat. <laughs> yeah, you can get more comfortable with it and thus get better. And maybe you get comfortable enough that you learn to move around and take a bow. Or, you know, you're like uh, my friend Ariel Manx. You do uh, backhand. What what'd you say he does back, back down your throat? He has the world record for doing the most consecutive backflips with a sword down his throat. Good oh, wow. God. Yeah. Good God. Uh. Yeah. Years, years, and years ago, contacted me via email. You know, I had no idea who he was. He just, he's literally a kid, uh, you know, and he, he emailed me and he told me what he's planning. He's like, yeah, I'm working on the, doing a back hand flip. I've been doing handstands with my sword down my throat. And of course I was like, fucking stop, man. Why don't you get a fight? Sword swallowing is dangerous enough. I want to see if I do it. I was like, dude, my advice to you is not is stop fucking trying to kill yourself. Like, you're not gonna make more money because of that. People aren't gonna maybe they'll applaud you a little bit louder. But I'm like, you can get applause without nearly dying. But you know, to his credit, he was like, yeah, fuck that uh, crazy old lizard. I'm gonna do whatever the fuck I want, <laughs> and he did it. He's goddamn amazing. <laughs> but still, way too much risk. I'm like. I, I get paid to swallow a sword standing still really carefully. So, you know, I'm not going to start doing backflips until they stop paying me. <laughs> you, know? Yeah. you know, that saying, work smarter, not harder. You know, right. We, we see this a lot with, yeah. um, we see this a lot with, uh, with the performers uh, in, in certain, I don't know, sub community, oh, I, not sub, but, you know, um, that are more protected communities. Like we see it in the wrestling world where guys have to do, insane death-defying drops through flaming tables on thumbtacks and mouse right. traps in order to garner a reaction and they probably the didn't even get paid the, worth yeah the, the more exploitable people <laughs> yes yeah um and uh i mean so have you had to get smarter in order to not be exploited yourself oh well, i mean it like here's the the thing about being exploited if you're if you're a good person right if you want to call yourself a good person there's a couple of easy barometers that you can use. Number one is, have you been taken advantage of? Right? Well, we all have, right? That's what happens. If you're if you're if you're if you're a good person, you get taken advantage of. Unfortunately, it's the cost of doing business, right? There's always mm -hmm. going to be somebody who's exaggerating their need or whatever, taking advantage of you if you're a good person. But you know what? Because you're a good person, you accept that and you help everybody. That way you make sure that everybody who needs help gets it. This is why like, you know, think people could be like, like, well, well, there's so much fraud in welfare and unemployment, whatever, like who fucking cares? Are the people mm -hmm. who need shit getting what they need? Good. Then that's the cause. Of it. And also it's, it's so ridiculous. It won't put one pair of tires on a fucking Jeep. So it's such a stupidly ridiculous amount of money to be arguing about in a government budget. But Anyway, digress. And we're yeah. trying to <laughs> guilt people for buying guilt people to go through people's grocery list and say, "Oh, you get you have food stamps. How dare you buy lobster and steak? Like what they're not allowed to eat? You know what they want? I mean, you know, or or, or alcohol. Like you, you can't have beer with that. I'm like, motherfucker. If anybody in the world needs beer, <laughs> <Right>? it's <laughs> four people. Yeah. For fuck's sake, man. <laughs> isn't the isn't the point here to make people's lives better? Right. When has anybody said, hey, I'm going to make your life better. You're sober now. <laughs> I'm taking away your booze. That's you would never. If somebody said to you, like, yeah, I'm never going to let you drink again. You'd be like, what the fuck do you mean? They'd be like, because I'm making your life better. Yeah, because I'm helping you. You'd be like, fuck you. <laughs> That's what you're doing when, when you're telling them, you're like, you can you can have food. You can't have anything that makes you feel good, though. Fuck that. <laughs> you know, I just realized that. Uh... Well, I'm assuming that this is your autobiography once more through the modified looking glass. Uh, and it's I not, not, really... not an autobiography. It's a collection of articles that I wrote. Oh, okay. Uh, but it's out there. It's still available yep. on Amazon, paperback and Kindle. 
Well, and actually, uh, it it just got available on Amazon last year because I finally got off my ass and did the conversion and put up a, a Kindle version of it. Which, if you're going to get a version, I actually recommend that one because I'm still re-editing and adding stuff to it, going back and adding photos and uh, just you know doing a hey, what do I think of it? When I first put the book out, it had been about five years since I wrote the articles, so I did an update on each one. Now I'm doing that again. 10 years after the book, 15 years after the articles. The uh, paperbacks you see listed on there are people that are selling the uh, the paperbacks that I used to sell on tour when I first put the book out. Mm. Yeah, that's why the price of them. So they're, some of them are probably the old signed and numbered copies. Some of the more like pricey them for ones. $24.99, and then there's three that are $38 acceptable. Yeah. That doesn't make sense, but okay. Well, some of those probably uh, include shipping, um, right. which is okay. Yeah, like I said, like, some of them could be just a regular copy because I did, I printed about 5,000 copies of the, paper ba- of, the, uh, of the paperback book that are out there that have been sold that I know of uh, other than the print on demands. So there, there's more, but there's 500. That are the, the first 500 were signed and numbered. So I don't know if any of those listed them being that way or not, but self-published. there are little, little differences. Yeah, self-published. I did the uh, the original paperback through, uh, was it Lulu? Yeah, Lulu.com. And then the, the ebook is on, it's a Kindle there. I used to have the, I used to have a PDF of it up on the, up on my website too, but I just kind of trying to get it to uh, the tighter, better editions like that. Basically, I did, I did it, did everything you're not supposed to do, and did it lazy. So. Well, <laughs> but it's out I there. Mean, it, it exists. Doesn't, it doesn't make much sense to go through a traditional publisher these days, unless you've got unless you've oh, got no, an agent to negotiate, right? I mean, yeah, you if, might as well. If, if you've got a deal, group. yeah. Like I said, if you if if you're if you're in a position to have an agent negotiate a deal with you with a house too, because I mean, it's and I don't know if you're familiar. This is one of those very common sort of. It's not a pyramid scheme. I forget the, the proper name of it as a biscuit, but the whole deal where, you know, your book gets on the New York Times bestseller list because you create another company that buys 500,000 copies of your books, which then gives them away as free donations to some program and gets a charity right off of it. So that you, you don't actually make money on it, but you make your book look like your book has made a lot of money. And then you're like, well, hey, I've already had a book on the New York Times bestseller list and all this. Like, you can literally buy your way through the industry that way. Similar things, you know, done, done in the record label yeah. industry. It's it's just one of these things that I think can, they call that a shell game or a shell company. Yeah, well, yeah. I was gonna say, yeah, you, you would use company. But it's not the shell. There's something like you know, like a pyramid scheme is obviously where all the money goes to the top. This is a different sort of thing, but it's done very often with political books. You know, when a figure comes out, like when when James Comey puts his book out, right? It's an instant bestseller, and all this, or or Trump. You know, Trump writes a book. His book goes well. Why? Again, Another co- the, a company is set up that explicitly buys all those copies of the books, and like I said, like turns around and puts them in a gift bag and gets a credit for it. So they 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 minimize the loss, sort of circle around the money. Yeah, but yeah, it's yeah. Apparently, publishing yeah, publishing is like yeah the publishing and uh, the uh, art world, you know, the gallery, the the gallery industry of fine arts, mm-hmm. things like that, all this stuff are just really weird money circles, right? And if you're not plugged into the right part of the circle, you're just contributing the fucking fuel. <laughs> yeah, I um, I remember like the Scientology would do that. They would just send like Scientologists out to bookstores with loads of cash to buy up Hubbard books to make sure he was on bestsellers list for up yep. until when he died. Um, I am surprised that yeah. no one like came up to you like to give you a deal to do like a book, but I can imagine like if a major publisher did that, they'd probably want to have either a ghostwriter or a editor babysitting everything you did with it. Oh, I'm I'm sure I'm sure they would, but that I think the thing is is that there's a there's a certain level of you know success or exposure, whatever that you want to call it, right? That you reach, but they're still very conservative. I still like you know I've got 25 years of experience. I've done. You know, major companies, trade shows, touring as a uh, representative for Jaeger, all this like. But the business world is so conservative; they're so risk averse, right? That it's still huge for them to go anywhere near anything like. Even though you might think you're like, wait, you've been around forever, and people see much heavier stuff on the internet all the time. In the corporate world, it's still considered just the craziest, wildest thing. Like, 
You want wait? You want to do a book with them for what? Like like yeah, sure. My my Ripley's episode did good numbers, and when I've toured the the, 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 the the, but it's not the overwhelming numbers, right? It's it's not the tens of millions of people that make them go. Oh well, if we don't yeah. do a book deal with them, we're losing money. You know, nobody was running out to buy the movie rights to the story of my life because I have not I, I, yeah, but so say is like, I crossed some threshold, but I haven't crossed that threshold yet. All that stuff, but I mean, yeah. industry, it's, but industry yeah. wise, they don't look at it as they don't look at me as the actual thing that I am. They look at me as a number sheet. And I don't just mean me. Yeah, I'm, not saying, you know, I'm not special. This is just the way it works for everybody. I watched it happen, yeah. happen with bands, literally watched a band uh, that was one of the support bands on a Jaeger tour. And they're, they're some of their people from their agency being in the production offices and they're going to sit around. So you just, you know, like a fly on the wall, whatever. And they're just like, yeah, you know, if the solo, cause you know, when you're, when you're doing support on a tour with us, they would have on when days that our tour was off, they played their own headlining show, you know, smaller venue for them because they were the support band for whoever, you know, that they like, like uh, when Chimera was out, uh, it's one of the first bands before uh, Slipknot. When we had a day off from the Slipknot tour, the Chimera guys very often were working in one of the, smaller towns or in the in-between towns playing their own show, right? And so everybody looks at that and they see what numbers they do and if their numbers are going up or down. And th this isn't about Chimera. This is a different band. I'm not going to put their name out there on this, but this is their people. There is people going, they're like, well, you know, the numbers aren't moving on these off. Numbers aren't moving. Show. Yeah. I heard the numbers aren't moving and then it froze. Right. Oh, so yeah. So the num if the numbers aren't moving, that's their, that's their people like basically saying, well, we don't know if we're going to, we're going to put in the effort anymore. Right. They're not, they don't care how they don't, they don't see how thrilled all the new fans are that, that saw them for the first time before Slipknot running to their merch table after they don't see that all they see are the sales numbers. Right. They don't see, they don't see people who are going to bring their friends when the next people come over, they see, Oh well, they spent about ten dollars per head. We want to see them more in the fifteen to seventeen range. You know, but they're, they're not making the numbers. Then, you know, move on to the next thing. So, Chimera, we're not the band that we're. No, no, that, that's not talking about. Yeah, it's a. I actually, I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have put anybody's name out there. But actually, you know, they did fantastic. I'll put their name. This way. I love fucking Chimera. These guys were great. Yeah, they were a it's fantastic group of guys to fucking tour with, making great shit, music. Man. Heavy as shit. Nothing remains. Classic, yeah. you know. If I but, can, uh, uh, I, and I, I will, uh, I'll call, I'll fucking mark out on this though. After we toured together, right? Uh, after we did the the Slipknot tour together, and you know, he saw me get darts thrown at the time. Uh, later, I think it might have been the Slayer tour, like right after so that fall, and they came out and visited us when we were playing in Ohio. And he was like, I want to throw a dart in you. I want to throw a dart in you. And I had started taking him in my chest. I was like, All right, well, let, I'll let you throw the last one. I'm like. You know, just but throw from the throw this, and he gets back and he winds up like he's gonna throw it as hard as he can. And I'm actually thinking like, oh shit, he's gonna throw me with this, and <laughs> then he so gently limp wrist arcs it in, doesn't even hit me, just barely makes it, hits me in the stomach like right next to my navel. <laughs> I'm just looking at him laughing like, what the fuck was that? <laughs> barely made the target. <laughs> so you you did uh, you did the human dartboard act too, huh? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, for uh, for for years, especially with Diego, it was a that was a standard for me, especially doing metal shows and music festivals. It's one of the ones where I like to like get the crowd up, so I usually save it to one of the later ones because I had my assistant, Dr. Griff, and we'd start off with him shooting or throwing three darts, and I throw the first one into my back, and then I would turn around and be like, no, 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 let's do a little better. And, like you throw it into my heart, and he throws the second, and the third. So we do that and get the darts to the chest. You get the crowd yelling and screaming, and then if they go really nuts, he put a big bucket of darts, and we do a speed round, and I would just keep turning around front to back, and he would just throw as many darts as he could as fast as he could, and I'd end up standing there with, like, you know, 12, 14 darts just hanging out of my chest, my stomach, you know, everybody's screaming, and then he'd just let him come over and rip them out, the blood start dripping, and, you know, bring on who the fuck ever's next. <laughs> that is so metal. That is more That's metal badass. than anybody you were – opening for uh probably i'm guessing but uh i mean uh so did you ever breathe fire too oh yeah yeah I've, uh, there's 
pretty much for any traditional sideshow stunt, I've got, you know, my variation had my version over the years. I started off with fire. That's how I got started, kind of got into sideshow. Or, I mean, I should say got into it. I was interested in a lot of stuff. It's the first thing I really attempted was fire manipulation and taught myself fire eating and fire breathing and uh, doing body burns and just messing around with different pyrotechnic effects. You know, being, being a little pyromaniac, uh, teenager, early 20s, something, uh, you know, playing with fire. And, then, and from there, uh, picked up the human blockhead, sword swallowing. Uh, did I loved Houdini as a kid. I was into, I knew how to pick my way up. Pick your way, what, out of locks? Um, walking up. Yeah, just picking locks. Yeah, picking locks, picking handcuffs specifically. Um, yeah, uh, walking on broken glass, uh, bed of nails, beds of swords, lines of swords, um, pierce weightlifting, you know, hanging things from whether it be from my ears, my nipples, my septum. Uh, before oh, I split my tongue, before I had my tongue split, I had my tongue pierced. I used to lift with my pierced tongue as well. Um, yeah, because that's. The, like the sideshow stuff for me goes before body modification. Like I was interested in show and it was very early on, like about 17, 18, I started getting into the idea. I wanted to learn more about fire eating and stuff. And I really started sort of messing around and trying to learn stuff. And I started going to libraries because at heart and I'm a nerd. That's my, my reflex. If I don't need to know something, you know, it used to be go to a library. That's where I went. And both my parents were teachers. So I had access to the school you know, extra times. And I was, I was a nerd and I looked up sideshow and circus and it was through that wanting to learn about things like fire eating and sword swallowing and stuff that I learned more about tattooed men and body mo and modified people in sideshow history. So it came together pretty quickly, but like the sideshow stuff was really there at first. And for me, learning the act of performing was not more important, but that was, that was always, that's always been more of my focus than the body modification aspect. It's like, but I didn't want it to be all that I had, right? And, but my act, what I didn't want to be a tattoo, uh, a tattooed attraction the way they had, the way a lot of them were historically, where it's like, hey, look, all this stuff's been done to my body. You know, hopefully I've got a cool story to go with it, but that's it. I've got a story. Uh, you know, I wanted to have the axe as well. I wanted to be able to do the working axe on top of it. That's I expected. You know, I wanted to be able to do the working acts, and then I decided, oh yeah, I think I'd like to be green as well. What what uh, what character from sideshow history uh, performer like first lit your imagination? Oh, the, the great the great Omi. Now what 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 is his is a, is a huge uh, influence on me. Hold on, he's behind me here. That's the great Omi. So the great Omi was uh, around the golden age. He uh, worked for Ripley's, which is one of the reasons that I was very excited when I got a call for Ripley's. Um, he was a soldier in the First World War, then got completely tattooed, like you see here, and uh, actually tried to re-enlist for the Second World War. And they were like, no, we don't think so. But he ended up, raising <laughs> he, he ended up working a war bonds program and uh, raising quite a lot of money for the war, for the war effort. Um, a lot of similarities between us. I uh, have a lot of the same piercings he does. Stretch lobes, stretch oh. septum, uh, filed teeth. He filed his teeth. I have my teeth filed as well. Uh, he didn't have a split tongue, but, you know, it was, it was the 40s. He, he did what he could. <laughs> now, he was, he was an amazing uh, performer. To me, he's particularly notable artistically because most tattooed men, most tattooed attractions throughout history have had, you know, traditional tattoos, pictorial tattoos. Hearts and banners, knives, portraits, biblical scenes, Last Supper, you know. His tattooing is non-representational art at a time when even the art world hadn't fully embraced non-representational art. Wow. Uh, yeah, so he's, I feel like he's really an incredible, incredible person, uh, story, just a lot of interesting things there, very inspirational to me. I, you know, I oh, see myself I and what I do as a continuation. Yeah, historically... Tattooed attractions go back, you know, they were bringing back tattooed natives and that and sailors started to get tattooed and, if, and now you've made it back to civilization and this is all you can do. Like that was the kind of classic story from uh, Captain Contensus and it was mimicked a bunch of times 
very successfully. Basically, it's a business model. And so I made a conscious choice when I started thinking that this is what I wanted to try and do with my life. I made this sort of I, in my head. I thought, OK, well, here's the archetype. Here's how it's been done. And like, how do I tweak this for the times that I live in? Right. Because that's what you do. You take the you, you take the recipe for success and you just make it work for your situation. That's that's you know, so many things are just it's whether or not they fit their time. He was called the, the zebra man. Yeah. So, some people call him the zebra man because it looked like the black work was kind of like stripes. But it wasn't that wasn't a conceptual sort of thing. Um, that was more just in, 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 the, in the press. Like you're not going to see you don't see banners advertising him like the old sideshow banners from, of the time advertising him didn't say that. But some of the press coverage did. Has there ever been any crossover between you and the wrestling world? I feel like there has been. Uh, well, uh, the Larry the Leopard and I did a wrestling match with the amazing Mr. Lifto as our guest referee for uh, the, the Travel Channel. The, yeah, it's the Travel Channel. It was Austin Underground. This is probably about 2004, 2005 ish sort of thing. So, like, yeah, it's a very good time for or for TV, especially for that basic cable stuff for a lot of sideshow and circus programs. And they came up with this. They're like, hey, you know, we're going to do these. We're going to do the underground scenes in these cities. So we set it all up. We get the local uh, pro wrestling group to, like, train us a little bit, help us out, and of course, use their ring. And they put on some great matches before us, you know, to really set us up and make us look good, get the crowd warmed up and going. And we went out there and we had a match. And thank God for their editors. They're, the editors of that program made us look like we could actually wrestle. But, wow, it was <laughs> – it was it was rough because Lifto and I are huge wrestling fans, and we really wanted to have a great match. Larry knows wrestling exists, but at times didn't seem completely cognizant of how it's real but it's fake. It's right. fake but it's real. He, he didn't he didn't he didn't understand where the line was and how it moved. Like at one point backstage, I'm looking at him and go, "Okay, Larry, if you get confused, all you got to do is tackle me." When you tackle me, I'm going to get up as I'm getting up. Let me hold your head down and I'll tell you what we're doing next. Yeah, I'd give him the next move, right? And so, but we get out of the match and he just immediately forgets everything. He's just tackling me over and over again to the point where I looked at Lifto and I was like, you know what? Fuck this. And I just started dodging him and matadoring him and like legitimately, like planning on it and like jumping on his back, and like, calm the fuck down. Shit, the river. And so. Yeah, but so anyway, but backstage, I told, told him that, which, you know, that's how that worked out. The other way I told him, the setup for our big finale was, so I had my corner man. Right? So it was the dart board. So I'm going to get, I get the best of Larry, and then he throws the tranquilizer darts in my back. Right? And then the whole thing is that Larry breaks free, and I'm staggering around, and Larry kicks me in the nuts. I'm like, okay. And I go, Larry, okay, that's when you kick me in the nuts. And Larry's looking, he goes, okay, okay, good, good. And I kick you in the nuts. And I'm just looking at his eyes and just something in my head like, you know you're not really going to kick me in the nuts, right, Larry? <laughs> Larry goes, oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. I'm like, Larry, inside of the thigh, inside of the thigh, dude. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, that was bad. I almost just got fucking vasectomy. <laughs> like, it was, yeah, so it was, it was pretty rough around the edges, but like I said, the crowd was into it. They were so drunk they thought we were good. By the time the uh, editors got done with it for TV, I you know, I wonder if that one is on, online somewhere because if it's not, it was. I, I remember just watching the finished program and being like, "Wow, they it really made us look like we could wrestle." They took all the good spots and like strung them together and made us look decent. I'm curious now. I got to see it. Um, I, yeah, I, it was there... definitely the Travel Channel. I want to see. You want to say something? What? Um, it, it would have had the roller derby girls because that's when roller derby was really getting big too, uh, taken off. So yeah, it probably. I mean, I mean, I I bet I have a copy of a VHS somewhere. <laughs> you know, it's a shame that we could we we could uh, they couldn't uh, fit you into the MCU or even just like a cameo to play off of. You know, the lizard in Spider-Man is like a little campy. Uh, like, I've been saying know? that for, for years, even back in the Tobey yeah. Maguire series. I was like, and that's back when I was, you know, had a Ripley's episode with 40 million viewers and stuff. Had a, you know, a little more, you know, immediate uh, relevance. I was like, 
they could have at least had one of a flyer for my show, like me on a poster somewhere, <laughs> like just a little Easter egg. But hey, you know, it's it's not too late. You know, the, the movies are are being made. It's uh, out there. I uh, I don't have my I'm I'm SAG eligible. I just I haven't uh, I haven't actually joined up because I've really only done two real movies. So it's not like I'm doing so much work that it's uh, that big a deal. I'm surprised you haven't been in, uh, I don't know, horror movies or or even, right. I don't know, like action movies. As, as you know, I like years, I think, I think it was like 2007, 2008, somewhere around there at one point, uh, somebody sent me, an independent filmmaker sent me a script that would have had me playing the villain in a horror movie. I thought it was great, but I mean, that's a, uh, it's, it's a rough thing to get going, right? I, I just imagine that he just hit a brick wall with funding or whatever it was, but I was I was completely on board. <laughs> but uh, hey, you dudes, every every one of these things that we're talking about, including your act, you know, you've got to pay your dues. To, it's very insular, right? Yeah. Um, but I don't know, man. A buddy, like a, a buddy cop comedy with you, yeah. you know, as as one of the cops would have even been. That that would be a great right. script for somebody to write. <laughs> Right. I mean, <laughs> well, it's I, I've done a few things that, like around Austin. Like there's often a, a student project or somewhere like that comes around. Um, you know, in the past, it's been hard for me to, to do a lot of the ones that I get asked about because I was touring so much. You know, now I'm not moving around that much, but maybe more. But there's there have been a few where it's lined up properly. So like I say, you know, not big theatrical. Release. For that, uh, I did a, a, a comedy that was um, done by the, the guy that wrote Jason Takes Manhattan. Oh. And uh, and directed one of the other ones, Rob Hedden. He did a uh, like a teen comedy called Box Borders. That was my first legitimate movie. And uh, Jason, uh, then Jason I did uh, Jason Takes Manhattan. Mm-hmm. Coincidentally, was was also a comedy. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah, this Good. was more intentional. <laughs> you know, yeah. there's <laughs> intended comedy and unintended comedy, right? Um, yeah, and then uh, Terrence Malick uh, had me in a few scenes for his. Uh, movie song to song no so that was that, that was that one was that was interesting because at first it was i was performing at fun 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 fest which is a an austin festival it's well now defunct but and he was filming there for this movie that he was making and at the time he didn't have the title uh but he just wanted like shots because i was there you know they asked me like oh can we come and film your show and you know we go but like, distant shots like you know talk to some of the actors and stuff just as if there are other performers at the festival you know, just to get like the mingling with the actual artists and, you know, actually at the festival sort of scenes, I guess that's what he wanted. And I did that and that went well enough that I got like this random call once later this casting office I was like, Hey, could you come and read for this role? Uh, you know, I was like, okay, what is it? And they said, well, Terrence Malick had you in shot you at the Fun Fun Fest That's and we'd like to maybe use you for uh, another role in the movie. So I ended up with uh, another role with a scene with uh, Michael Fassbender and Natalie Portman. So I sell them wow. drugs. <laughs> that's awesome, Terrence Malick. That's like that's a that's a big name in the mm-hmm. in the artistic cinema world, you know. Yeah, and that, I I gotta say, like, and I don't know how he knows of me or knew of me if it was just because you know being around Austin or or what it is whatever. The, but he was incredibly nice and and very very generous to me and just yeah, you know, like I said, basically was like. Yeah, you guys are gonna put Lizard Man in the movie here. <laughs> so, awesome. And wow, I made and I made the edit right, like a uh, you know this this story is him shooting twelve hours of film and like some people that you know shot for months end up completely edited out of the films. So I was like, no, he, he kept the entirety of both scenes. Wow. Well, that just shows your versatility that you can you can. <laughs> that's a romantic drama from what I'm song to song. It's described as an experimental romantic drama, but uh, there you are in that. And I mean, you know, there's horror movie potential, there's comic book potential, there's all these things that you could go from one medium to the next, and and there it would be pretty easy to work you in, I would think. Right? Yeah, that's. Uh, I'd like to think that too. But it's it's um you know it was, uh, I saw an interview recently with uh, Batista. You know, wrestler turned actor, obviously, you know, yeah. and uh, him talking about how, you know, and, you know, obviously, Batista, huge, you know, he was big in wrestling. Yeah, I'm a yeah. wrestling fan. I was, I, I was still watching, you know, pretty dedicatedly when he was really peaking. And, um, you know, 
he he said that when he left wrestling, he thought he was just going to go like, okay, I want to do movies, and he just get to pick and choose and do it. And he's like, no, nope, doesn't matter. Even when you're that big, is you need an agent. You need someone to go out there and shop. You need someone to be constantly saying to people in casting is like, hey, what about him for this role? What about him for this? He goes, because the problem is it doesn't matter who you are. There's a thousand other people that that would fit into that peg too. And it comes down to who's it, – it's like selling soda, right? It's not your product. It's advertising. Coke or Pepsi, who, who's the number one seller in, in any given year? The one that spends the more on advertising. So that's what it is. If you don't have an agent, if you don't have someone doing that job – for you, you're that you're, you're not in that loop. You're not in that process, and it's just you know, and, and it's by necessity, right? An industry wouldn't be able to function if it was constantly open submission, right? <laughs> if if somebody had to catch me, was like, well, I guess I got to look at seven billion people now and see who wants to be in the no. It's you know, it's yeah. like no. We we they, there are filters there for a reason. The first filter you want is like, well, who among these people are actually fucking actors? Who among them are any good? <laughs> who among them that are or any good actually fit the role, right? You, you, all these fucking things that break it down. And he, but even then, you've still got this huge pool of people. So it's like, well, who do we know that's available? I don't know. Call the agency and see. <laughs> right? And so you get whoever the agency is pushing. A cantina scene in The Mandalorian, though. I mean, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm ready. You can be my agent. <laughs> so, there you go. But pick up the phone, man. Get to work. <laughs> <laughs> that will that will definitely uh, put those hopes to a halt. <laughs> well, um, is there any is there anything that uh, we may have missed? I may miss that uh, you would like to bring up. Do you have a Patreon or anything <laughs> that you want to promote? No, no. I mean, I think you know you already uh, you kind of brought it up there pretty organically. Anyway, my book is there, and like I said, I'm still kind of working on adding to it, revising it, so additional content's coming out, and uh, that's. You know, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna push anything, that's that's gonna be it at this point. Other than that, um, well, I mean, hey, get vaccinated and uh, get tested and fucking beat the pandemic, so you, I'll start doing shows again. <laughs> make it, really make it, not, program, make make it, make it not reasonable. Make it, make it reasonable to gather crowds of strangers on street corners again, so that I can go out there and do dumb shit so you smile. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, and I've I've never done the the Patriot stuff. I always figure I'm like, you know, if if somebody wants to throw me a tip, they can be a fucking tip. <laughs> but mm -hmm. you know, otherwise, I'll try and I'll give you something for it. Like I'll sell you a T-shirt, sell you a book, sell you whatever. You know, we, we can we can make an exchange. <laughs> well, uh, I really appreciate you giving me your time uh, tonight, man, Eric. It was an honor, and on such short notice as well. Uh, I mean, hey, that's how it works out. That's it. it if it's too far in the future, something's going to happen before then. If it lines yeah. up immediately good to go <laughs> right um good for you man on securing you know a foothold for yourself and so uniquely you know in, in i mean you did it on your own terms uh from all i can tell and good for you that, that's for that's the point <laughs> living on my yeah. own terms <laughs> all right well uh yep. i'd well, love to have you back when you have, when you have news to report or something Cool, man. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll shoot you an email if something comes up or, you know, touch base with me sometime in the future. Feel free. Thanks for having I'm actually, me on, guys. I'm going to follow up with you uh, later tonight, actually, on something, but not not uh, for a future appearance, but just, you know, uh, I'll, I'll follow up with you, though. It's good. So. Thank you. Fred. Great talk to you guys. Great, great show so far tonight i mean both guests you know it, 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 after that drought there for a week or two you know uh trying to follow bruce cavill you know that both yeah. came uh prepared tonight 